let's see, verse 24, chapter 3, Galatians. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So we see the law identified he, uh, here as a schoolmaster. Uh, it's interesting that this is the analogy Paul uses, uh, because the schoolmaster, uh, that is the law, is doing something to us uh, that is bringing us unto Christ. Uh, it's you know, right there in the verse. In this analogy, the law is teaching us something, that is, to show us our spiritual distance from God. Uh, this is how the law brings us into Christ. It shows us just how far away we are from sinless perfection. Uh, that is, and it, of course, there's only one person who is sinlessly perfect. That is, you know, God. Uh, now, this idea of intuitively understanding our position before a perfect creator, uh, this has been one of the hallmarks of the saints from the Old Testament to the New and beyond. And uh, intuitively, this idea of, you know, seeing our position and then relying on faith, I guess might be a better way to say that. Um, for instance, by faith, Abel uh, offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, uh, through which he was commended as righteous. Uh, God commanded him accepting his gifts, and through the, his faith, though he died, uh, he still speaks. Uh, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that was to receive as an inheritance, uh, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Uh, by faith, the walls of Jericho went down after they had been encircled. Uh, and by faith, uh, one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, Rahab the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had been given friendly welcome to the spies. Um, our inheritance is obviously not works uh, or living right uh, in the sense that you know we're living good to make us like score points with God, uh, you know, to make us holy. But it is in faith that is hearing God and believing Him in His edicts, despite the evidence and despite the potential consequence consequences. Excuse me, uh, that we are justified by faith, Chris. Hey, that's a pretty interesting uh, angle. You know, the um, Rahab thing, it would almost seem as if it was good works until you realize that she was um, she was doing that because of sort of reverence for their God more than she, anything else. She knew. Uh, I, I was actually quoting Hebrews in all of those places. Um, she knew she knew that they couldn't stand. And uh, so she had only one option. And that was, you know. Your God is so much stronger than my God, so I'm going to appeal to him for mercy. And, you know, she just knew that he was the one true God. So by faith, even though she's in this, she's in this walled city, she knew that she would perish uh, if she didn't do something. So uh, that's precisely the point Hebrews makes. Sorry, go ahead. Very good. Uh, uh, okay, now this this is really one of these things that like every commentator ha makes a comment on. It seems like the idea of schoolmaster here again, the verse wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to, uh, uh, to unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. The word is uh, in the Greek is pedagogos, and we don't actually have a good translation for that in the English because we don't have this office. Uh, anybody that does this job in the English and in, in our culture anymore. Um, I think rather than me just sort of um, telling you what it is, I'm going to read William Barclay, who did a really good job of summing this up. He says, Paul is still thinking of the essential part of the law that, uh, that the law did play in the plan of God. In the Greek world, there was a household servant called Pedagogos. He was not a schoolmaster. He was usually an old and trusted slave who had been long in the family and whose character was high. He was in charge of the child's mortal welfare. And it was his duty to see that he acquired the qualities essential to manhood. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of interject here. Uh, well, let me see where he goes with this. He had uh, one particular duty. Every day he had to take the child to and from school. He had nothing to do with the actual teaching of the child. But it was his duty to take him in safety to the school and deliver him to the school teacher. That, said Paul, was like the function of the law. It was there to lead a man to Christ. It could not take him into Christ's presence, but it could take him into a position where he himself might enter. It was the function of the law to bring a, a man to Christ by showing him that uh, by, him, by himself he was utter, utterly unable to keep it. But once a man had come to Christ, he was no longer needed. Uh, he no longer needed the law, for now he was dependent not on the law but on grace. Uh, 
So what's interesting also is that this uh, Pedagogos was, you know, probably a wealthy Roman family would uh, hire this person for the heir of the, the family, like the firstborn son would be somebody mm-hmm. they would hire this guy for. And he would um, he actually was given the uh, ability to discipline the child. And uh, Guzik brings up an interesting point that every time the Pedagogos was pictured in ancient Roman culture, he had a stick in his hand. And this is the kind of idea that he would whap them with the stick, you know, whenever they were huh, out of line. Interesting. So that that really, I think, brings in a really clear picture of, of what is meant was where the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Um, and I, Spurgeon says a really cool thing here, but I'm going to read it in the next verse about that, too. Um, so and I'll say this uh, in this way, too. Well. What is, what should I do here? I think I'm going to mention a Schofield reference here. The, <laughs> the argument uh, does not turn upon the extent or nature of the pedagogue's authority, but upon the fact that it wholly ceased when the child became uh, a Song of Solomon, uh, which I could read. the uh, Anyway, when the, when the minor became an adult, the adult son does voluntarily, which formerly he did fear of the pedagogue or pedagogos. Um, but even if he does not, it is no longer a question between the son and the pedagogue, the, uh, but the father and the son. And uh, so, yeah, I'll just continue to the next verse. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Verse 25, Galatians chapter 3. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Uh, this new way of interacting with God, this faith is something that, uh, to continue the analogy, uh, is like graduation day. The law existed to show us that we could not be like God through our own works. Uh, I guess if somebody, when people ask me about the law, uh, sometimes I refer to it by saying, uh, the, laws, the law was there to show us one thing. You cannot be like God by your own works. Uh, it showed us that we could not be reconciled to God, uh, that we could not be counted righteous, that we could not be sinlessly perfect, of our own accord, but by faith we are counted righteous, reconciled to God through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are made part of God's family, an adopted son. He looks out for us and watches over us like a father would a child would to a child uh, once we are under once we are in the faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, these are all things the law could never do; they could never achieve. But now, after that. Uh, but now after that the faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, as it says, and are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Chris? One of the verses that I think really speaks to this, and I think this is what it's all about. We are no longer under a schoolmaster because we have this law written on our hearts. You know, it's um, it's something that we desire to do. It's kind of like if, you know, if somebody raised raised you up, you know, really good and... Um, you just sort of became, you know, eventually you're sort of, t- the training wheels are taken off, I guess. But a great verse, obviously, is Ezekiel 36, uh, mm-hmm. verses 26 through 28, where it says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land, and I gave your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Um, Spurgeon, uh, I got this quote from Guzik, actually. So it's Spurgeon via Guzik. The law <laughs> ceases its uh, a bit, the law ceases its office as schoolmaster when it comes to be written on our hearts. Um, boys have their lessons on slates, but men have their laws in the mind uh, in their minds. We trust a man where we should carefully. We trust a man where we should carefully watch a boy. When the child becomes a man, his father and mother do not write down little rules for him as they did when he was a child in petticoats. Neither do they set servants over him to keep him in order. He is trusted. His manliness is trusted. His honor is trusted. His best feelings are trusted. So now, brethren, we who have believed in Jesus have the law written here in our hearts, and it corresponds with what is written there in the scriptures. Mike? Great stuff. You can't go wrong quoting David Guzik or Spurgeon. <laughs> right. You know, when you put them together, it's like peanut butter and jelly. 